Forbes magazine calls him one of the most listened to recording artists of our time, with more than 3 billion streams and 11 number one albums on top Billboard charts. This is All Heart with Paul Cardall. Cause you took my scars, bruises and Welcome, I'm Paul Cardall. I uh, just came from the recording studio where I was with an orchestra. These are probably some of the best players in Nashville. These are classically trained string players who have degrees. Very blessed to have worked with them. We're working on my music. I have new music coming this year. And when you surround yourself with people who are much more talented than yourself, you will sound good. I've had a lot of different people represent different faiths on the podcast. And of course, this is not all religion conversations. If you're here for the first time, we interview a lot of different musicians and authors, various topics, but but I am interested in history and music and religion. And we've had like Jeremy Duncan, a pastor from Canada, I wanted some clarification on if there is mistranslation in the Bible about homosexuality. We had a great episode on that. I had Father Bill Watson, who is a priest in the Catholic Church, a a big leader in the church. I wanted to clarify doctrines about celibacy and Mary. That was a great episode. I had Pastor TJ Timms, who is a non-denominational pastor that went to King's College. I wanted to talk about where he believes he got his authority from. These are just interesting topics for so many people who want clarifications, and we need to expand our minds in order to understand and respect other people's beliefs and where they're coming from. And that's what we're doing today. We're going to talk about Mormonism with Mark Mabry. Mark is a very well-known American photographer who has turned his photography into art and uh, he loves creating art that depicts scenes from the life of Jesus Christ and a lot of those scenes come from the Book of Mormon of course we all know about the musical but uh, he has created images from that that idea, that book that is considered scripture to people that are part of Mormonism. And we'll clarify, is it a church? Are they churches? Is it, There's just so much confusion about it. So I'm glad Mark's going to be here to talk with us about this. And uh, the reason I'm asking him is because we both moved to the South and he decided, even though he's very successful doing well to go to divinity school at Vanderbilt. Now it's Latter-day Saints, which is the, the, the main phrase for people that are part of the Mormon culture. They don't normally go off and go to divinity school. So we're going to talk to Mark about that and get some clarification on a lot of these ideas uh, today on my podcast. So without further ado, let's get into this conversation. This is All Heart with Paul Cardall. So what are you up to, man? You done traveling for a second? For a second. I'm heading back out on Friday. Where are you going? Vegas and then to the Grammys. Uh, oh, cool. I'm going to hit record here, but most people That's know cool. you for your art. Uh, tell us a little bit about Reflections of Christ. Okay, Reflections of Christ was was honestly just a passion project for me. It's a photographic depiction of moments in the life of Christ. I ended up doing doing a, a series on the life of Christ that went viral, 2008 viral, whatever that is. It was, um, it was email chains and was YouTube. It wasn't really YouTube. It was like beginning of Facebook, mm-hmm. but mostly like email chains and blogs. Right. And then we had a couple of exhibits that traveled all the way around the United States, just all over the place. And, um, and my life really changed at that point. I went from being a photographer to, I guess, an artist where I was making things for the love of art and instead of by commission. And 
And that, that changed me a lot. That really focused. And I've always been somebody more or less focused on Christ. But when, when you have something go like viral, viral, and um, especially in my hometown where it originated. And every time I'm trying to eat a burrito, somebody comes up and like tells me about their experience. And you've gone through this too with music and how it affected their life and they're crying and your burrito's getting cold. Um, And I never had, I guess, a, a deep academic understanding of Jesus right? I I read the stories and probably a little more carefully um, with regards to how they may have looked, even though historical accuracy is completely out the window when we depict Christ because, you know, um, no artist is depicting Christ in a historically accurate manner. Um, And I don't, and I think it's like the third or fourth most important thing anyway, to be historically accurate. That kind of was, has rode me for, you know, 12, 13 years until I finally had some free time. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to dig a little deeper. And that's when I went to Vanderbilt. Um, but, but in the meantime, became a pretty voracious reader, I guess, and learned to discuss Jesus with people of all, all stripes, Christian and non-Christian. It's been really cool. It's, it's been co- a, a cool way to remember Jesus in my daily life. Yeah. It's the fact that I have to get up in the morning and make sure that my personal brand doesn't ruin um, this idea of Jesus that I've presented. And those that are watching on YouTube, because you can watch on YouTube if you don't know about this, some of your... Oh, so we are YouTubers. I'm going to get back. My face looks huge. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of your earlier work of taking images of Jesus were based on the Book of Mormon. And this is what I want to talk about, because this has been a topic of conversation for a lot of people all over the world. What is Mormonism? What is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? What is LDS? What is Latter-day Saint? Um, There seems to be these different titles for the Church. And... um, I guess like Catholicism, you have so many different breakoffs. And likewise with Mormonism, you have so many different breakoffs. So you decided when you move, you know, into the Bible Belt as a faithful practicing Latter day Saint that believes in Mormonism, that you were going to go to Vanderbilt and get a what is this, a theological degree? Is this like a divinity program? Yeah, it's a master's. Technically, you could be ordained? I could. Um, I could. Uh, everybody that I was going to school with um, was in the ordination process for either um, a Presbyterian ministry or Baptist ministry or, you know, Methodist. So, yeah, those were my classmates. The, the one distinction I'd like to make is, is you said believer in Mormonism. And, and when I use Mormon, because I still, that is part of my vernacular, right? The church, the church is trying to like reassert the proper name of the church, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and get away from the Mormon, which was a pejorative term. Um, but I think where I adopt Mormon is when we refer to the culture of a lot of the members in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So do I believe in Mormonism? No. Do I believe in the doctrine of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Yeah, I have faith in it. Um, I, I believe it, right? Um, but I, but I have a big, there's a big distinction. <laughs> do I believe in, you know, every strange tradition that has been passed down? No. Um, and I think if you get any church that's been around for a couple of hundred years. And, and if they had like the nickname and the real name and the same like cultural dichotomy, um, you'd probably most members of whatever church it is would be like, no, you know, I'm not really a Baptist if that was, the, but I believe in the tenets of the Baptist religion. 
if that makes sense, because I think there's cultural baggage with, with every church. And that was one of the big awakenings for me at divinity school was that everybody was uncomfortable in their skin. They're uncomfortable being tagged. Like you're a Mormon, you're this. Well, no, I'm a believer in Christ. And that went for everybody there for the most part. And I, Vanderbilt's interesting. Vanderbilt's just nuts. Let's get it out there. Um, it's not a conservative, like Bible belt school that you'd think being in Nashville. Anyway, thank you, Vanderbilt. Hopefully you'll let me back in after my hiatus. <laughs> I want to read something because I want to be specific in this question because I think yeah, you, yeah. you know the answer. Um, in 325 AD, all of the Christian leaders gathered because Constantine, the Roman emperor, emperor asked them all to gather. From and basically, they debated scripture and the identity of God. They created a defining statement or articles of faith known as the Nicene Creed. Some people pronounce that differently, but the Nicene Creed. And since then, that creed has helped shape modern Christianity. It is accepted by all three branches of Christendom, Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestantism. And when I tell my friends that are non-denominational or evangelical or Baptist that they're all Protestant, they, they get confused by that. But it all falls under the schism of Catholicism. Not Catholic, yeah. Catholic, you, yeah, you're out of the branch. So it's no secret that Latter-day Saints do not accept the creed or any other creeds prior to the founder, Joseph Smith, writing those 13 articles of faith, which Latter-day Saint leaders would later canonize as scripture in 1880. So with that in mind, give us a couple things that differentiate the theology or the doctrine uh, of of Mormonism or what the, the, the leaders of the LDS Church are teaching versus what thousands of Christian denominations who accept the Nicene Creed believe, because that's a big thing. Not oh, totally. Yeah, the creed. So there's several churches that don't, but it's like maybe 1% of every denomination that believes they're Christian. And the number one thing you hear in the South or throughout the world is they're not Christian because they're not biblical Christians. Why would the Latter-day Saint church, I guess, be defined as a Christian church if they don't believe in the Nicene Creed, Jesus? You know, I know there's a million ways to answer this question, right? But I think if you ask most people who have ever had an LDS neighbor or associate, is is the Mormon living next door to you Christian? They would say, absolutely. Right? And to me, I could ask 50 Christians. I could walk outside, and that's my whole neighborhood, and knock door to door and say, hey, can you tell me about the Nicene Creed? And they'd be like, the, is that a band? Um, I think it's uh, the discussion of creedal Christianity. Just, the discussion of creeds should be left to people that are confined to classrooms. You know, like, I don't think it matters in the real world today. Right. I will tell you that you mentioned the Godhead being the big issue, right? Mm -hmm. The the um, Latter Day Saint theology is that God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost function as one perfect unit, but that they are distinct spirits, like they are distinct people. And and I actually I've thought a lot about this because I said, what is the like? What are the practical implications of a differing uh, a differing view of the Godhead? How does that show up in the real world? Why does it matter? I've held hands. I've raised hands. I've hugged. I've blessed. I've whatever with Christians that are picturing a completely different God than me. 
and the prayers are still working. With with Jews and with Muslims that are picturing the probability of God with me and the prayers worked, right? And so ultimately, I don't think it's an important question, but but it's important to some people. Here's where I like to, and listen, I'm going to say something that can be taken out of context and can get me canceled. Here it goes. When my kids, um, when my kids, present me with an issue like this, an issue of faith, right? I say, listen, it comes down to us fighting about our imaginary friends. We sound like two kids on the schoolyard fighting about our imaginary friends. I have not seen God. I have no proof that God the Father and Jesus Christ and His and the Holy Spirit are three separate beings. I'm assuming that someone on the other side of the table has not proof to the contrary. We're arguing about imaginary friends, and I know that's completely offensive to biblical scholars and whatever else. But there's this, there's this point at which you're in the dark, and you have to just have faith. Um. And and I absolutely and I have faith in in what I believe. Am I to the point where I'm like hitting the pulpit and saying, "I know it's this way, and you're going to be damned"? No, not at all. Um, I think you and I, you and I were together with um, with my uncle, and we went to go hear um, uh, Doctor AJ Levine. I mean, she's Jewish. She knows more about the New Testament than any person I have ever met, professor or otherwise. And, and to see the New Testament through the Jewish lens. Yeah. This is an important principle that I picked up on. You cannot look at life only through the lens that you were nurtured. You yeah. have to find a way to pick up another lens that you've never worn to see things in that light. It's like with history, you know, a uh, rough stone rolling, the controversial novel or uh, biography by Columbia professor. I don't know if it but well, it, it freaked a lot of It was controversial at a time before a lot of major changes happened in the LDS church. I call it yeah. Vatican II for Mormons. So, so it, it, it really was like a transparency thing. And that was basically like, focus on Jesus. Don't call us Mormons. Change the a lot of the way that things are communicated. Everything is Christ centered, um, and I think it always was. But more specific, the mentality that you are exhibiting. Um, I think we're finding more and more Latter Day Saints who are like you. Than oh crap! There goes the church. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, you know what they used to always say: if, 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 if they didn't feel good about it, the missionaries would have destroyed it a long time ago. So, yeah, exactly. But totally, yeah, it's this interesting, interesting dynamic. Um, and, and of course, you can get into well, it's according to how people live by their fruits you shall know them. But the founder of the faith and the whole foundation and uh, leaders of the church have said that everything rests on the idea that Joseph Smith, the founder, either saw God, Jesus, and the Father as separate beings, or he didn't. So you're saying you've never seen God, which is a very honest answer. I've never seen God. But, you know, we both have never seen God, but we felt, we felt, but you can't always go on feeling because our feelings may be deceived. Um, but there's this notion that he saw it so the entire foundation yeah. of authority rests on that. Well, I believe I believe that he did, but I and I and I I wandered a little bit. I wanted to make one point about the Godhead, like okay. to to close that. And it's this: the practical application. When you think of um, why does it matter, right? Um, in to me, it it shows up in this. If you were to ask again. 
who knew very little about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, hey, do you know any Mormons? Yeah, tell us about them. Well, they're really into their family. Um, I think that would be a fair assumption that the top one or two things that you know about an, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ is that they are a family people, right? And and if nothing else, and I and I've never heard a talk about this. I've never heard it preach this, but it makes sense. We're talking about a father in heaven who sent his son, his actual son, right? That's the Mormons believe different spirit, different person. Son. It's not God incarnate, but that they're one in thought, one in purpose. And, and that's how, that's how we, and so if you look at, if you look at an LDS family, another unique wrinkle in LDS theology that, um, gets underspoken about, but we've been talking about it since Joseph Smith, is we believe that if there is a Heavenly Father, He did not achieve who He is without having a Heavenly Mother. And so when LDS people talk about a Godhead, there's this other teaching that a, a man will never achieve that level, and neither will a woman, without their, without their partner without their male or female partner. And in that we have a heavenly father and heavenly mother, that they are the key to each other's salvation and each other's like progression, Christ being the key to salvation, but each other being the key to progression, right? Um, I think it, you talk about LDS people and families. You talk about how we talk about marriage and how we do marriage. We talk in an LDS wedding ceremony, nobody gives away the bride. And I noticed this just the other day, um, sitting in a, a ceremony, and the 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 man, the sealer, the person um doing the marriage, giving the yeah, doing the marriage says, um, you know, Susie. Here you are, and you give yourself to him. And the same thing to the guy, you give yourself. And it's, it's agency. Wow. It's, I'm coming together. It's not, you want to talk patriarchal, go to every single wedding ceremony almost anywhere right now where the man is giving away his daughter. You know, that's so that's true. Patriarchal. That is so true because in all the ceremonies I was ever in, yeah, the woman is given the choice first. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is this what you want? Yeah. I didn't, I never realized that. That's a beautiful, beautiful and then, theology. Well, thank you. It, and then the, the idea of a ceiling, this idea that we are going to weld you together so tightly that that is the intent is for you to be one for eternity, just like our Heavenly Father and our Heavenly Mother, and just like they have all of these kids, that they would do anything to get back. And, and the, the, the we need a hero, our, our older brother, Jesus Christ, to come down, face, take on all evil, and whatever theory of atonement you want to apply right there, um, but to lead us back to the presence of our heavenly parents, I think it, it, even if we're wrong about the Godhead, I think that that understanding of the Godhead has blessed, um, countless lives yeah. as, and listen, LDS people are just as bad at living our theology as non-LDS people. And, uh, but when done right, there's nothing like it. And no, I apologize. I get, it's really close to, the, close to the surface. I have so much hope. I have so much hope for humanity because of marriage and children that and that is the like genesis of tears is, you know, and to me, that is what the theology is. We screw up a lot of things as members of the church, but I think that's something that we're doing right. Um, for Catholics, 
what I've learned being married to a Catholic is that, you know, Mormons have this concept of a heavenly mother. Catholics, in a way, do as well with Mary. And I was just at Fatima in Portugal, and Fatima is the third most visited Catholic site. This is where three little children over five different months were visited by Mary. And wow. the kids, I mean, how do you argue with the kids? These kids were... They were accused of being liars their whole life, but Mary told them three things that was going to happen that came true about the World War and all these things. But when you go to Mass or the Catholic Church, they do have Mary, who is the mother of Jesus or the mother of church. So she's that heavenly mother figure. And with Jesus, you have the Father. So you do have male and female represented. Um and even in Jesus, you have the masculine and the feminine. But um, in Mormonism, you have heavenly parents. In Catholicism, you have a mother through Mary. But uh, you talk about eternal families and that when people are married, they say, till death do you part. But in Mormon marriages, Latter-day Saint marriages, it's eternal. It's forever. You continue on that relationship in the marriage covenant beyond the grave. Yeah, I think the key distinction is that most Christians, and I'm going to generalize because I think it is true, the argument is Jesus is enough. You don't need marriage. It's just for you here so you can learn how to not be selfish. And and I thought about that a lot, Mark, like, this idea that I wouldn't be with Tina in the next life. And, you know, one of the LDS apostles, Holland says, I can't imagine heaven without my wife. I can't imagine yeah. heaven without my wife, but being a, a married couple bound, like, you know, we're brothers and sisters, we're friends. Do we need that marriage covenant? And then I, I realized to take that, argument further that we don't need to be married muslims and i have many muslim listeners and i love you guys and i respect you guys but most of them they believe in jesus but they don't believe god needed to suffer that his power is enough so there is no need for the atonement and christians are saying you don't need to be married in the next life because Jesus' love is enough, is enough. And Latter-day Saints are saying, neither is the man without the woman or the woman without the man. In Christ, in the fullness of that union yeah. continues. And I love that idea. It's happily ever after. It is happily. You know, and, and really, I, it's interesting you mentioned, you mentioned Islam. I was, I was just at dinner with a bunch of new... Afghan refugees. And I the way they did family, I was like, can I bring you into Sunday school? Like they were so tender and so sweet with each other. Um it was, it was incredible. And I know again on the far the the fringes of Islam is patriarchy to a degree that's just vicious and horrible. Right. But on the fringes of Christianity, there's that too. Um, but, it, you know, I think there's something that draws us together as family. And, and to me, that, that's how that strengthens my, um, it strengthens my faith that I, that I have in the nature of the Godhead. Um, but again, we go back to AJ Levine. When somebody, somebody stood up in class after she gives this incredible thing about Jesus and goes, and it was, it had, what was the name of the church we were at? It was, it was wherever it was. What it was, it was the Church of Christ, founded by Alexander Campbell, who was the one responsible for nicknaming Joseph Smith and his followers the Mormons. Thanks, Alex. Anyway. I so this guy stands up and kind of antagonistically after I mean she's given this thing and I'm sitting there going goosebumps I'm feeling the Holy Spirit and I knew you probably were too and my uncle was were like 
this is incredible. And he goes, how can you know this much about Jesus? And basically now you're going to go to hell because you don't believe in it. Right. And she goes, she goes, you know what? I've spent years of my life with Jesus. I, I stopped short of worshiping him as a Jew, but I love Jesus. And if everything I have learned about Jesus is right, if it turns out in the afterlife that I'm a little bit wrong, the Jesus I know isn't going to send me to hell. And that's another unique thing about, I think, LDS, that, that even LDS people don't realize. When you read the Book of Mormon, it is the most universalist book on earth. There is like a universal stripe to the Book of Mormon where you're like, whoa, why are we so uptight about being right? Because um, it, and the whole structure of what we do in the temples, how we baptize for the dead, we marry for the dead. We do all this stuff for the dead. Um, we do we do work for the dead. We the family's such a big deal. We believe that um, progression is an eternal endeavor, and that I mean, this give it our best shot here on earth. You know, there's trauma. There's things. I was I was having a discussion with a good friend who was very. Um, I won't name his denomination. Doesn't matter. But he was like, I gave him the example. We were talking about temples. I gave him the example of a little girl raised in communist China who knew nothing of Jesus. I said, so you're telling me she's going to hell? He goes, as bad as it sounds, yes. I said, you're kidding me. I said, I'll respect your faith, and I'll respectively disagree with it. He goes, if she wanted to know Jesus bad enough, she would find a way. Well, I'm sorry. Having been in trafficking situations, in persecution situations, there are some people who are never going to wrap their minds psychologically around faith in this life. And I don't blame them. And and so the thing that I love about this component to LDS theology of redemption of the dead is that as much as those things break my heart, and I fight against them with all that I have. Um, I'm talking about the the injustices of the world. The that the Joseph Smith had the foresight in 1830 to be like, no, 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 it's going to be hard. And and yes, the mandate is baptism, but not everybody can get baptized. It's just not not working, right? And so we're going to do it for the dead. And they're like, dang. So, yeah, Mormons are weird. We got a lot of weird stuff. But if I could cherry pick a lot of the things that we believe and just keep them in my life like that, I think I would. You know? Yeah. I know people have a lot of thoughts, so please comment. I know this is going to be a feed of he said, she said, Bible. Yeah, we have to the comments off. Etc. No, it's kind of fun. <laughs> It's kind of fun to do, but uh, so let me ask you as a practicing uh, Latter-day Saint, uh, when you come across people like me who were practicing Latter-day Saints pretty much their entire life and then left, uh, Mm -hmm. people leave for many reasons. Rarely do Latter-day Saints leave because they feel led to give the gospel by their fruits, ye shall know them. It's hard to argue that anyone who's part of any denomination who's pursuing Jesus, who's living to the best of their knowledge, um, and they know they're flawed. Um, how do you respond to your friends and family like me? And what's your advice for other Latter-day Saints? How do I, so how do I respond to people that leave? Yeah, I mean... Two, two parts. First part, let me ask you the question. In your personal experience as one that has left the faith that I hold dear, how have I treated you? Oh, like, um, like I never left. Yeah, man. I believe so firmly 
in with the redemptive power of Christ. That I'm not worried. And and I say that I'm not worried for you. I'm not worried for me. I have a lot of things wrong. I know I have a lot of things wrong. It's so much bigger than any of us, I think, can comprehend. That for me to sit there and be like, you know, Paul's an idiot. I'll call you an idiot about a lot of things, but I'm not going to like judge somebody's faith. I'm not going to judge the dark spot. And, um, and it's hurt. I know as a, when someone leaves your faith, it hurts. Cause you're like, wait a minute, man, you're calling me stupid. No, I, on, a, on one level, I get frustrated on a human level, on an intellectual level. I'm like, come on, man. On a brother level, on a spiritual level, I am like, dang, what could I have done, first of all? But maybe it wasn't about me. Maybe it is a path. I mean, I'm when I went to divinity school, I would watch little kids come from Christian homes, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. We all have, we're all working on masters or multiple masters at this point, so they're all 20-something. And they've come from where nobody has ever questioned their faith before. These kids break by the end of the first semester, the first time they academically study the Hebrew Bible. And you've got a professor who lost his faith long ago. And and these kids just snap, 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 snap. And, and I found myself in the position, being an older student, I was 44, you know, and I, I'm, in a, I'm in a little hiatus right now because I'm working with a different group doing Christian persecution stuff. But I found myself sometimes even in class raising my hand and being like, dude, like, don't discount the faith of your parents. Don't discount all those things that you've felt your entire life. And so that that's me in real life, right? Um, and and I'm glad. I think that was a super valid question that that you just that you just asked. And I, and I'm happy that I could look you in the eyes, knowing that we love each other. And I hope, you know, my greatest fear is that one of my kids will leave the church. Right? I can't. I can't wrap my head around that. I can talk to Baptist parents. I could talk to Catholic parents, Jewish parents. Um, and they all have the same fear, yeah. right? When are my kids going to leave the church? But what will I do? And so I've tried to instruct my kids. I said, I want you to be, and I said this to them the other night. Um, we joke around. We have the church has this come follow me program is what it's called. And it's what the, the outline scripture study for the year. And we're doing new Testament this year. And I said, kids, this is our annual come follow me. We're really bad at doing it. We talk about Jesus all the time in our house, but I'm really bad at sitting down and doing the program. So we did it on January 2nd <laughs> and then never went back to the gym. Um, but I said, kids, I want you to be flexible in your faith because things are going to happen that disappoint you. Yeah. You're going to read things about church history and people that you revered that, that scare you. But I want you to be inflexible in your pursuit of faith. I never want you to stop pursuing God, but I want you to like not break. A friend, a different friend taught me this just recently. He said, um, people come to me to talk about their faith concerns. And before they bring up any actual thing, I say, let me ask you a question. Are you looking for a way in? Or are you looking for a way out? Because if you're looking for a way in, I can't stop you. You're here. These things are going to resolve. If you're looking for a way out, let me list you all the ways out that I have that I just haven't acted on. You know, like, yeah. um, anyway, but Paul, I love you, dude. You know I love you. You're a good friend. I, I, uh, yeah, I admire you. Everything you're doing, the fact that you would further your education, try to understand people, why they do what they do, why they believe what they do, so that you can have greater love and respect for them and be able to communicate with them uh, because of your passion for Christ. In closing, for me personally, 
uh, listeners and, and Mark, the Jesus that I've come to know, I'm going to be 50. You know, m- my first encounter with him was as a 13 year old in a hospital dying. All my brothers and sisters, and there were seven others, came up in the family station wagon to say goodbye. Wow. And in that moment of suffering, I had never felt more loved. And everything I had was right there in that room with me, my parents, my family, and Jesus, uh, who at the time, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, was right there with me. And I could suffer. Because in the suffering, as Jordan Peterson would say, in that suffering, my life had meaning. And that was the whole purpose of life. The words are very clear in the scriptures. It's kind of hard to see that anybody is not qualified to be welcomed into his kingdom. And I tell this story, uh, and we'll end on this, and then your thoughts. You know, (laughs) there's this, this is a story of uh, Peter, and Peter's at the gate. And you've got Peter standing at the gate, and there's a massive wall around heaven. Okay, and look, he has to check you off the list to see if you've been put in in, in the book of life to see whether or not you qualify. And for Latter-day Saints, you pretty much have to show your temple recommend. But for everybody else, are you in the book of life? So you go to the gate, you present it to Peter, and Peter lets you in if your name is on the list. Well, if you're not on the list, he says, I'm sorry, you didn't accept Jesus uh, according to what we created, we started. So you're going to have to just not come into the kingdom. Finally, Peter and James panicked, come to the, come out of the door to Peter and say, Peter, it is getting so overcrowded in there. I don't know what you're doing. You're letting way too many people in. Are you sure you're letting people in that's, that's on the list? Are you letting people in that are not on the list? He goes, listen, I keep a tight schedule. No one's getting in unless I let them in. And they're like, well, it's too crowded. It's going to break. The walls are going to break. He's like, well, James, John, could you please go around the wall of the kingdom and find out if there's a hole, a ladder? Go see what's going on. They leave. They come back 100 years later because it's a big wall. They come back and they're like, Peter, and they were laughing still. Peter, you're not going to believe it. You know all those people that you rejected? I found Jesus on the other side of the wall, throwing people up into the kingdom. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. The, that's the God I know. And uh, I know you have to go, but um, what is your hope from all that you're doing, your art and uh, the master's degree? What is your hope that you can accomplish? I want to be able to tell the story of Jesus better, right? On a personal level. And, and maybe even a meta level, I wanted to know him better. And, and I, I believe in Christ. I believe in a savior. I'm, I'm a guy that loves repenting and changing. And, and I think there's a lot of people on earth that don't have that faith, that don't have that hope in their heart and in their belly. Um, and, and I want, I want to maybe do something that can help ignite that hope. And, and in that, I find, um, I find camaraderie. I find camaraderie with you. I find camaraderie with everybody who wants to tell the story about Jesus. And, and I want, I want to, I want to do that in a less confrontational manner than, than the nineties brought us. You know what I'm saying? I think we're in a new era. I think we're almost in the post, the post I have to be right era where we're Christians. And in that I'm LDS, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, are, are finding each other on new terms. And, and I do recognize that. I write, I, I write and I, I have a pretty 
decent group that I write to, and more than half aren't LDS. And and when we talk about Jesus together, yeah, there's a lot of before and after that we disagree on, you know, the imaginary friend stuff. But when we're like right there in those 33 years, man, we find a lot of commonality and and we bless each other's life. And so I just hope to do more of that. I hope to participate in that. Well, you're a good man. Love you. Love your family. Love, love everything you're doing. And uh, I'll put in the show notes a link to your art, which... Thank you. It's, it's really amazing, the, the art. And there's just a lot of light. If you want a really beautiful image of Christ that feels lifelike, um, that feels so real... Yeah. All right, brother. See you later. Talk soon. Bye bye. Cause you took my scars, bruises, and broken heart, and numbed all the pain. Show me how to heal, and now I don't feel broken anymore. Number Number one, Billboard pianist Paul Cardall. Do you believe in miracles and second chances? Over a decade ago, I was raised from the dead. Read Paul's story, The Broken Miracle, by J.D. Neto. Visit thebrokenmiracle.com.